You're listening to the Lessons in Real Estate Show, sponsored by Mission First Capital, bringing real estate investment deals for active duty and veteran investors. Your host, Anthony Pinto, searched land, air, and sea to find military investors just like you investing in multifamily and commercial real estate, both active duty and veterans. Hear their stories, learn their lessons, and be inspired by the obstacles they have overcome on their path to financial freedom. Whether you are overseas or stationed at home, if you want to get started as a military real estate investor, this is the show for you. And now your host, Anthony Pinto. I'm so excited to have you guys here today on the revamped new and improved version of the Lessons in Real Estate show. I wanted to refocus on my mission here in life uh, with this podcast, and that is to help teach and inspire 1 million military members and veterans to achieve financial freedom through real estate. And as a part of the March to a Million campaign, my call is to show you the path to freedom of time and money, whether you intend to stay in for 20 years or get out next year. And so listen to the stories of fellow military members and investors just like you struggling, overcoming, and achieving success in multifamily real estate, and even some of them doing it while active duty, and really dig into their lessons learned, as well as their failures on their path to success. Uh, But you came here for the show, so let's get to it. All right, welcome everyone to the Lessons in Real Estate show. I'm your host, Anthony Pinto, and again, we have a great guest today, kind of a unique guest, because he he has a very... um, He has a varied background on what he's been able to accomplish really in the past 18 months. Um, And uh, today we have on Hugh Carnahan. He is a millionaire in about 15 months, and he went from zero to 118 units and now has about $30,000 a month in cash flow. No prior experience in real estate or formal training. And uh, he took a property from a cap rate of about 2.68 to a cap rate of seven in four months with his secret rep in the two-second lien. Hugh, super excited to have you on to talk about your life. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, man. You know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, we've kind of known each other off and on for the past like year, or year and a half or so. And, and you know, I think it's it's good to finally kind of get your story out there because it's it's uh, it's. I think it's a lot of, um, of motivational, uh, really dedicated, ambitious track that you've taken in the past, you know, eight, 18 months, two years. So, uh, but let's kind of start with your, your military background and, and how, kind of how that led you into real estate. Sure. Yeah. So um, I was never actually in the military. Um, I was in a military academy from age 10 uh, through graduating high school. And I only applied to senior military colleges and um after that, I decided about age 22 that I was tired of waking up really early and exercising. So I decided I have nothing to do with the military at all. And I go into the private sector. And then I end up marrying someone who was in the Navy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so right there I was as a mill spouse. Um, and, uh, you know, I was happy for it. So that's kind of my background there as kind of how I got into it. And uh, that relationship didn't work out in the long run. However, uh, it was still a wonderful time. And I met so many awesome people from that. Love it, man. I love it. Yeah. And now you're rocking that, that great mustache there too. <laughs> That's right. You know what? I said, I want a mustache one day, so I can't join the military. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Love it. Curled up and everything. Um, well, cool. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how that ends up working out that, you know, you, you end up doing something for gosh, 12 years of your life and uh, you think you're getting away from it and you end up following you know, you end up uh, going right back to it in the end with the military. So I think that's awesome. Right. And most of my friends too, you know, almost all of my really close friends are all, they all went in the military. So uh, even though the ratio at AM, I think that of the core cadets there, the senior military college pro- program, they're like 51% went military, 49% went private, uh, private sector. But most of my really good friends, uh, almost all of them went military. So yeah. Love it. Awesome. So the, the military really laid the foundation uh, for the discipline. So I got to bring all the experience is with it. And it was a really fun, uh, well, I'm not going to say fun now, but, uh, you know, just <laughs> those things really, that being able to be disciplined and, and have the ability to segregate your time out and, and, you know, follow a standard, it's stuff that's extremely relatable. And it's, you can re-weaponize that in other areas of your life, even though you were annoyed when you had to do it you know by force right 
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, it sounds like, you know, even though you didn't have the traditional military track with, you know, uh, going and serving and, and deploying and everything else, it sounds like you still kind of instilled the same lessons learned and the same discipline and the same resourcefulness uh, that a lot of people get from the military in the first place. I think that's awesome that you're able to able to take those lessons and not go the opposite way where you, you know, didn't want to have anything to do with the military or, or any you know sort of discipline like that. I think that's, it's amazing that you were able to, to take a lot of those lessons learned from there. So, so you got out, you know, at 22 and went private sector. So where, where did you kind of shift uh, your focus to after that? So my major in college was MIS or management of information systems. And I went into IT and I worked for major oil companies in um, Oklahoma. And then about that time, I started talking to a, uh, a gal that I knew that was still in school and who was going active duty Navy. And then about a year uh, and a half into working up in Oklahoma, uh, she ended up graduating and then being PCS'd out to uh, San Diego. So I left my job up there and then moved to San Diego. No plans, you know, sold the house. Uh, I was like, you know what? I've been saving money. I've got 12 grand of reserves in my bank account. And I'm sure that'll be fine. You know, we used to, you know, here I am, Missouri boy living in Oklahoma. I'd be like, yeah, expenses. I got that move out to San Diego and almost immediately run out of money. Um, you know, we weren't married at that time. So there was just, you know, the, the normal stuff, like you can't get on base. There's no information if something happens. And um, so I ended up uh, going uh, out there and then I ended up finding a job in tech out there for a company called ServiceNow. And so that kind of was where I ended up uh, getting a lot of my seed money to start investing. But I was basically an IT guy at that point when I first left college at age 22. Interesting. So what were you doing more of the sales side of it or more of the engineering software type? So I was on the engineering software side. Uh, okay. I was effectively a customer service engineer. And um, so I like to explain it to people as I was the, the tech support. So when you called in with a problem, <laughs> I was the guy on the end of the phone. Luckily, it wasn't business to end user. It was just business to business. So I was usually talking with the IT guys um, elsewhere. And most of my day involved listening and problem solving and inside of computer systems and figuring that kind of stuff out. So yeah. So how long did you do that job for? So I did that all the way until I left um, San Diego. So that was about three years and then about six months after that. So Basically, I moved back to Missouri. Um, my marriage had come to an end at that point. And then I had six months uh, where they just kind of let me on and work remote uh, while they found a replacement for me. So I basically was there for about three years. Gotcha. Okay. And then, uh, so how did that, so you, you moved back to Missouri and, uh, you know, that's, you're able to, to uh, do that remotely for a little bit. So what did you kind of focus on after, after the remote part there? Well, so the first thing I did was during that six-month period, I had a California income, but I lived in Missouri, and it was a great time. <laughs> um, but Easy. after that, uh, there's a, a family business that uh, my father started in 1952, and they made boat parts for the marine industry. And um, basically, it's a, it, it, they're in the manufacturing space. So I knew I was going to be going in uh, to manufacturing side. So their sales and headquarters was in the United States. But then they had a massive manufacturing plant with 20 buildings the size of, you know, a small ship um, over half a, actually, I don't even know the word in English, but it's like half a city block was just our factory wow. and 350 workers. And so that's where I was uh, pointed towards and going towards. And I had no experience in background. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting to me. Um... I think a lot of people, particularly, um, you know, immigrant families that have owned their own business end up everyone kind of funnels into the business eventually. So was that kind of your intended goal was, was to kind of, uh, was to end up in back in the family business to start with, or did you not want to have anything to do with it? I think when I was younger, I didn't really want to have anything to do with it. Um, and then like, as I grew up, I was kind of like, well, actually what they've built, what my family has built was actually pretty pretty impressive. And then I was just more like, what can my skill set do? What can I lend? So when I went into that, I became the vice president of corporate operations uh, on that side. And I basically handled the logistics of um, all the manufacturing stuff and mainly on the China side, which was the more important side that actually 
made the parts, right? Selling the parts is easy if you have parts to sell. Right. So that's kind of what I end up uh, going towards. Again, uh, went from an IT background directly into that with no no exposure or no prior training. So, so, that, so I mean, that's kind of a, a scary thought going from something that's in IT where you kind of you know, spent three years kind of perfecting your craft and, and knew a lot about that to manufacturing and running a company where, you know, you had you obviously had been exposed to it because you you know been living that for your, for your majority of your life. But to go into a completely different facet of business and the logistics side and, and managing a manufacturing company. I mean, that's huge. I mean, what was going through your head when you made that shift? Um. Not much. Uh, I kind of just showed up and um, a lot of it, hold on a second. A lot of it turns out, uh, ends up basically being kind of leaning on that um, experience. Uh, Chris Voss has a good one, he, uh, where a good quote, which is, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall back on your highest level of preparation. Mm -hmm. And luckily being from a 10 year old boy through 22, you know, and kind of taking, you know, marginal amounts of risks or calculated risks, being able to just show up, see what's happening and then adapt to it or, or perform on the spot and then figure out what you don't know, right? Because when you show, when you walk into most situations, you don't know what you don't know. And so it, it was part of that. And then also coming from an IT background, almost all of IT or my parts of it was problem solving and figuring out how to make things more efficient. Um, so when I actually joined the family company, I found that we were on a sink. I was basically, I had joined a sinking ship and, um, and the company was around 68 years and I didn't have experience. I wasn't qualified at that time to, you know, to help turn things around, didn't mm -hmm. know anything. And um, so I did, you know, I just, I was at a loss and it kind of was scary. So with that, I hit the old YouTube, YouTube university. And I did some Googling and I found a free secret weapon that's out there. And um, that was called two second lean. Mm -hmm. And that is my secret weapon. And that's basically what I ended up later applying to my life and, and business. And, and, and we'll get into that later. But it really blew my mind at the difference of just moving from a being a regular guy, not knowing much to just slightly tweaking the way you think, really not the way you think, the way you saw the world. Mm -hmm. And then all the creative juices started, started flowing. And then that was how we were able to kind of turn that company around. And then later when I was applied to, but basically how did I step into the business? I stepped into it with uh, no experience and not really knowing what to do, kind of freaked out a little bit, but also just waiting to figure out what I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think your, your story, um, I think it sure would resonate with a lot of people, particularly those who are active duty and, and, and have a W2 for a, a, almost a forced W2 until, you know, they get to the end of the contract or they retire or whatever else. Right. Um, and it's, it's a very comfortable position to be in, right? Like, you know, you're getting paid whether you're on leave or not, right? Obviously a very stressful situation that you could potentially be dealing with. But um, the thought of, of having to get out, whether you're getting out at five years, 10 years, 20 years, and having to start a whole new career is, is scary for a lot of people. I mean, it's scary for me, right? I still have, you know, probably two years left and, and the thought of, of what I'm going to do after it, it you know, it's, it's on my mind a lot. Uh, so I think your story with, with having a, a career where you were in a different country, you're in a different state, doing a completely different lifestyle. Uh, to coming back to, uh, you know, a, a company that you never really wanted to be a part of in the first place that, that you ended up, you know, taking kind of running with um, and that kind of uncertainty with what could happen next and not knowing enough to, to get started. I think that resonates with a lot of people um, and in particular in real estate, you know, it's, it's a lot of people, I think, get into the analysis paralysis part where, you know, you, you can do all this reading and all this knowledge base and all this building of, of, of building and knowledge. And until you actually take any action on it, it doesn't really matter um, because you may be scared to take that first step, not knowing what's going to happen or not thinking you have enough money or enough, you know, uh, resources or, or whatever the kind of limiting factor is. So I think your story would definitely resonate with a lot of people. I appreciate you sharing it. Yeah, I, I think uh, to your point, I think uh, military individuals are uniquely uh, in, in a position where they have interesting tools available to them that they can use to further themselves along. But two, the training they have wasn't whatever your job was, right? You're a nuke, 
your training isn't that you're a noob. Like, it, yeah, parts of it are that, but your training are, you can learn things well, you can follow directions, you can be put into uncomfortable situations you know, and do critical thinking, problem solving, and figure your way out of that. Mm-hmm. You know, and so military folks, you're already used to that. And when you go into the civilian sector, and you know, whether you, you know, surrender your contract, or I think it's picking up, a, you know, turning in your DB 214 or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you're now going out and you can do whatever. Like you're now in charge of if your life is a mess or not. <laughs> and that is a scary thing. Uh, but everyone is absolutely capable of taking that and doing whatever they want with it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't think about that before they exit. And then they're just like, maybe they drift for a little bit, or maybe they just hit the ground running, you know, have everything lined up, go right into the next thing. So it's definitely easy and plausible, but also just taking that breath to think I can do it. I just need to figure out what, what, uh, what I don't know. Yeah. 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 I, I think, um, I can't remember what the quote is exactly, but, uh, you always find an excuse not to do something if you really don't want to. And, um, you know, if it, you know, real estate, there's so many different types of real estate you can get into. And really there's so many different types of businesses, even outside of real estate you can get into. Um, and I think a lot of people discount the fact that, you know, the military really does prepare you for leadership jobs, whether you're an E3 to, uh, you know, an O10, right there, you're, you're having leadership roles, um, you know, every day that you're having to deal with that the average person of your age probably isn't going to have to deal with. Like, think about, think about like a 19 year old Marine that is going, that gets weapons training is going to get deployed, right? Like think about what everyone else in your graduating class from high school is doing now. And you're, you know, fighting for your country overseas, potentially. That's freaking awesome. The skill that you learn from that is invaluable. You're you're responsible for not accidentally shooting the guy in front of you. You have to know all this stuff, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an impressive amount of training. And also just the fact that you have been rigorously trained, um, whether you think you retain that or not, like you, you are changed because of just what you had to go through. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so let's get into lean. Cause this is, I think this is going to blow people's minds on this. Uh, so, you know, you, you got into YouTube, you learned a lot of that. You did a lot of Googling to try to figure out what to, what to do with your job. And you stumbled across, you know, the, the lean process, the two second lean. Um, and now, you know, kind of fast forwarding, you're now one of the, you know, the world's foremost experts on this. And so explain to us kind of what two second lean is and, and what you learned about it that kind of transformed uh, running your company. So the, so I, what I read across was a, a video called um, Lean is Simple. It's by Paul Akers. It's an hour, 37 minutes and 44 seconds long or something like that. And it basically altered the trajectory of my life indefinitely. Mm-hmm. And also hopefully many people's lives because of the things um, that I get to do and share with other people. Really, but it, it altered my state of mind. What Lean is, is it's a secret weapon that allows either you personally at an individual level to accomplish like 60% more with half the effort all the time. It'd be like if you had a half hour extra every hour, it's that powerful. Now, if you are a uh, business owner, that's where it really shines or Mm -hmm. a team leader rather, Uh, it doesn't have to be a business owner, but if you're in charge of other human beings and you do this, then what lean really does is it's if if applied properly which most people don't it is a a culture of continuous improvement where you have all of the people on your team critically thinking and engaging in thoughts really really well and a a great example of that is um you know it can be applied to universally to everything but one of the ones is you know i applied to my personal finance i applied to my businesses it was designed for manufacturing so that makes sense but it doesn't just apply to that um, there's uh, Captain Sam Balch, who is currently the battery commander in, in, of, uh, in, in a battery in the 82nd Airborne, applied it to how fire control missions are sent. And he took the number from seven minutes to 12 seconds. So they received the information and it took seven minutes for them to respond before they even got the rounds in the air to seven seconds or 12 seconds. And that was basically it, crazy. And um, that, I mean, all it's applicable to everything. So it's a different way 
that allows people to be able to see waste in their life, identify it, and then just if you can see it, then people will creatively come up with problems. We as humans are in incredibly creative. There's greatness inside of all of us if you only train them how to use that. And then when, when lean is applied to a business properly, which focuses on the culture side, which is what my specialty is, then that right there allows you to have a uh, company that independently moves against, you know, dynamic thinking of what the military tries to aim at, right? You have decentralized command making independent decisions for a greater goal. But, and so I applied that to my company, the manufacturing sign, but it really shined when I applied it to real estate. Um, and I can get into that if you like as well. Sure. Well, let's, let's dig into to lean a little bit more. Um, Cause sure. you know, I, I obviously know at about, and we've talked extensively about it, but you know, this, this idea of, of finding waste, uh, it seems simple, but when you first get started, if, if it was so simple, everyone would be doing it right. And doing something about it. Um, but when you first get started in this and you're like, you know, how, how do I actually go about looking for this? And then the second step is how do you actually go about kind of managing or eliminating that waste? So let's, let's start with the first part there. Okay. So the first part is one of my favorite phrases ever. And it was that smart people refuse to believe how simple it can be. It's almost my motto. And uh, being a country bumpkin from Missouri falls right into what I like to do because I'm not very smart. I was a D student, D for diploma. And, um, <laughs> and, and I just follow it and, and keep things simple, right? So the, on a serious note, seriously, some people are so smart that they, don't, they refuse to believe it can actually be that simple. So if you can just show someone something people will end up being able to solve the problem, but they have to realize there's a problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. So lean uses something called the eight wastes and it trains you and, and they exist everywhere around us. They exist in this podcast. They exist in the room around me, but especially in businesses and organizations. And if you can learn to see waste, then you yourself or whoever it is that you just, that, that can see it will creatively come up with a solution. Right, they'll MacGyver a situation around it, or but if they weren't ever aware of it, um, then they have no idea that they need, they need to change it. When I go into things, and I don't want to get too much in the weeds, mm -hmm. but it's whatever, whatever you think you're doing, right? You're on a sub, whatever you guys think you're doing on that sub is not what you're actually doing. What you're doing is you're dealing with how to feed everybody, you're dealing with you know, how to get up and down the stairs, where the information is on printouts, how to get the information across the way, and what you're actually doing, which is operating a submarine that does something, that's a very small fraction of your time. What you're taking up with is I have to step around this passageway or I have to do these things. In an office setting, it's insane. Um, where your printer is located and how many times that printer is used every day will add up to um, often thousands of miles walked for your employees a year. Um, you know, there's a guy, David Perret, we fixed a pen cup, like literally where he keeps his pens in his desk the other day. And it ended up saving him 28 miles that year. Um, and in manufacturing facilities, a great example is water fountains. You know, you'll have a manufacturing facility and they'll be like, oh my gosh, you guys, we're, we're, we're behind on orders. And then they don't have enough bathrooms and water fountains. And so, you know, six or seven times a day, uh, one person will go for a water or go to the bathroom, but there's one thing and it's all the way away from their department. Well, if that company would have spent 40 grand and put a bathroom in each place, now all of a sudden um, they've got an additional, you know, four or five marathons a year of walking cut out from every single employee because they didn't have to walk to go to the bathroom. You're not asking the employees to work more you've actually had them work less because they're easily doing stuff. So it's this idea of being able to identify problems. And as long as you can see them, it's not rocket science. Right. What people think they're doing, they're not actually doing. So, so I let's get, it. yeah, let's get into a, a real estate example. Cause I think, um, you know, we, we did the pen thing as well. And like, you know, now it's like a hundred times easier for me to find the pen. And, and I think, you know, going a step further than that, you know, what what is actually lost when you go looking for your pen well you got to spend five minutes looking for your pen you're now not focused on the task of why you tried to look for the pen in the first place right now you got to get your mindset back into whatever you're trying to do 
and you got to put your, your pin down again because something distracted you and you got to look for your pin, right? So it's more than just the action of reaching for a pin and reaching back for it, you know, every day in the miles. It's like the opportunity cost that you get from not focusing on the task that is actually getting work accomplished, right? Because so actually searching for my pen doesn't provide value at all, right? Actually picking up my pen and writing down notes or, you know, signing pieces of paper or whatever else, that's actually value added. And so everything right. in between needing a pen, finding the pen and getting the final paperwork or whatever written down is, is all value is non-value added uh, activities. And so I think that's right. an interesting thought is if you get, you know, two, three layers deep on that, like, okay, this person needs to go to the bathroom. Well, they got to walk across, you know, the whole way to go do it or get a, go get a drink. Now, what if they stop and they, you know, chit chat with someone along the way while they're having to wait for the water fountain to go. And now that's another five, 10 minutes that they've, that they've wasted. And now it's 30 minutes before they come back to their desk from what was, what could have been a five minute, you know, bathroom break. Um, that's kind of what I think in, in my mind as a business owner, you can kind of look at uh, and, and really think about on that level. Right. And, um, you know, from, from another thing too is, you know, I think you really glossed over a, a quick point about the pen as a very simple example that most everyone can relate to. Unless your pen is touching a piece of paper and writing, that is the only few fractions of a second that mm -hmm. it adds value. So when it comes to real estate, um, same thing. I mean, we can go into like a flipper example or a contracting example, because a lot of people who are listening, um, that's a big thing. You buy a distressed property and you're, you, 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 I know you focus a lot of multifamily, right? You buy it, this distressed property, and then all of a sudden you have to renovate the rooms. Well, what's the best process for that? Well, there's all these wastes, right? You got to get the tools. You have to move the tools from your vehicle. First off, you got to get the tools to the sites. Then you got to move them from the site, mm -hmm. you know, to the rooms. Then you got to get into the rooms and you actually have to demo stuff. Then you got to get all the stuff from there. And like, it's just an order of operations thing that if you just knew what to look for, it's like a secret weapon. Here's a great example. My contractor ended up having a, a bag of tools, right? The only value added thing is what, Anthony? Uh, the bag of tools? Yeah. When, yeah, when he actually does what with the tools? Actually uses the tools. When he actually uses the tools is the only time they add value. Mm -hmm. So he had brought them to the site. It added no value. He brought them up the stairs. It added no value. He then places them in like a, room, a staging room where they had no value. And then we go, then he has to go rumble through the bag to find the tool he needs as no value. Then he goes to the wall with carrying it as no value. And then finally he does something with the tool that adds value. There's a difference between not adding value and it not being necessary, right? How am I supposed to use the tool if it's in the truck? But at least you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. So what I determined was if he would have just carried the tool bag with him into the room, then he had all the tools available. Well, him and his guys had one tool bag and they were walking approximately 40 steps into the living room and then 40 steps back. And they were doing that about 200 times a day. And they had three guys. So if you did, you know, three times 40 times uh, 200 times two, because they walked there and they had to walk back with the tools, mm -hmm. that becomes a very large number. You multiply that by three, you know, that's three feet um, per step approximately, right? About a meter a step. Now, all of a sudden, here we are, you do that, you know, 261 days a year, which is five day work weeks minus, you know, five day weeks, weeks minus holidays and weekends. And all of a sudden it's this astronomical number. All that time, all you, that was just the time your guys spent walking to the toolbox. It wasn't mm -hmm. time that they spent actually renovating. So what we think we're doing is not what we're actually doing. You're paying your contractor to renovate. Now that's only one side of the coin on the employee side or the contractor side. It's way easier to not walk four or five marathons a year. You know, every, I found out it was like about three miles a day they were walking for that one tool that they were sharing. And I was like, did you know that I paid you as the end customer, you know, $38 a day today for your guys to walk to that toolbox? I'm going to buy 60, a $60 tool for you and you get one, you get two of them. So each to so two of you guys can have that. But I was able to see that because I was trained to see it. My contractor, now he can see it. But that was kind of a great way to start the conversation. 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great example for for um, for flipping and real estate side of things. So um, so so let's get into more of the kind of the nuance side, because I think, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the examples you brought up are more tangible aspects like, hey, you got to walk to this distance or you have to uh, you know pick up this ta- this item or do this task or whatever. Um, but I think a lot of real estate companies do a lot of things um, online or virtually or, uh, you know, take place on, on a computer. And, you know, it's less about, hey, uh, I have to walk this distance and, and more intangible aspects. So for a real estate company who's more focused on um, uh, uh, more than tangible aspects of like calling brokers and evaluating deals and doing a lot more of their day to day kind of actual tasking on a computer. What kind of things do you see uh, lean being useful in, in that setting? Right. So I can get right into that, but you actually have a very great example of that firsthand experience about um, a lean experience in your own company. Um, what would that be uh, in your point? Uh, I mean, I think there's a couple of different ways. I mean, you could talk about file placements and having to go look for a particular file. If you need to provide something to someone, um, it can be as simple as, you know, getting like what it takes to get the podcast set up. Right. Um, and all the information ready to go so that it doesn't take me 10 minutes to find your bio and then actually go find the link for Zoom and all of that. So that that's personally what works in, in my in my realm. Oh, right. Sure. Yeah. So, so those are really good ones. And from a sequenced task oriented bit, uh, you just described that each one. Um, one of the most critical things of lean that is rarely talked about in Western culture at all is, well, it's the word culture. Right. Mm. And it's having a culture of continuous improvement, right? Uh, a culture of continuous improvement that's dedicated to serving your customer and, and making their own lives easier and better. So one of the way, places that I differ is while I said the contractor thing, that is something that everyone can follow step by step. And that's the easy part. The owners will always think like that because it's kind of, it's kind of their butt on the line, right? They, they really, they, they care. They, they're, the, they're ones that owe the, all that money. So they're going to think like that. The trick is how do you get every single member of your organization to think like that? You know, mm-hmm. how do you get a decentralized structure to independently see the waste, solve the problems, and do that without you. Case in point, again, back to Captain Sam Balch. The moment that he left that billet, moved to his next position, it was PCS, the next guy came in and it reverted back to, 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 to seven minutes, right? You'd think that someone would take notice and say, hey, oh my gosh, that, that's incredible. In fact, in the not, in the not taking of Pyongyang, um, we, took Pyong, we, we, we took not Pyongyang for the very first time, and that was deemed impossible in simulation because we changed an order of operation. And it's how do you teach people ownership and how do you teach people leadership? Um, and that's one of the things why the military side is so uniquely designed for, and, and it can really, this can just complement that so well because all of us, are in a, you know, where we're trained from leadership, even if you're the new guy, right? You're talking about that, you know, 19 year old Marine, he's leaning, learning leadership on a team level, right? And so being able to inject a culture of improvement, a culture of continuous improvements is how that works, right? Making people feel grad, uh, validated, making people, uh, giving people the authority to make small changes, right? Obviously not big command changes, but that's almost exactly what the military wants, right? Hey, I'm the general. We're going to go there. And then the next guys, well, okay, well, how do we get the supplies there? And then the guys under them, hey, guys, we're going to you know, be in a wedge formation and you know, do this. And then they're going to all figure it out down the line. But the general didn't have to go and micromanage all of those things. And the, mm-hmm. the, the mechanism to build that culture when it comes to lean is really it's called the short feedback loop. Um, and I'm giving away some secrets, but those are the secrets. <laughs> so right, right here, here's how you can be successful. And most people will think it's too simple to work, right? You start off your day with five minutes and you talk about what's called a three S improvement and what you and your team are going to do. Three S stands for sweep, sort, and standardize. And I'm not going to get into that, but basically it's a time set aside to make your day better. So five minutes of that, 
Then you do 25 minutes of a 3S time, which is making, you're not allowed to work. You can't answer emails. You can't even turn your computer on. Mm -hmm. You can clean your computer. You can uh, make a jig. You can rearrange your office. You can rearrange those files. But all you're allowed to do is make when you do do your job easier. Then you do what's called the morning meeting. The morning meeting is mine, lasts about an hour. Various companies will last different times. Some are 30 minutes, some are 40 minutes, whatever. That morning meeting time builds the culture. And uh, there's really a really interesting thing that's going on behind there, but you don't talk about work ever. He's like, oh, it's a company meeting, it happens every day. Um, and you basically, you have that time and it builds each person on the team cycles through and they lead that meeting. Um, and then that is really what's right on point and, and teaching people how to lead and how to have critical conversations. And I, Anthony, I believe that you have experience with the morning meeting personally. What was your experience like? Yeah, well, my, my morning here or my morning there was actually my evening here. So uh, I was a little more awake than everyone else the same back in the States. But um, yeah, I mean, my experience with that is it's, it's, it's a tremendous way to uh, build confidence in individual people and build leadership skills in, in everyone on the team, right? Uh, but having a standardized format, right, you can see what works, what doesn't work. You get kind of that instant feedback on, on how to improve things. Um, you know, if, if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, like what slides work, what don't, what doesn't work, you know, um, and how long does everything so need to be, culture, like, and all that. You had a culture that existed in your company before. Right. And then you started the morning meetings, and then you had a different culture afterwards. What was that culture? What were the differences? I think the, the first part is, you know, we, we were kind of an island in of ourselves. Like everyone was kind of doing their own thing. And we weren't really uh, communicating and talking about, hey, this is working. This is not working. Um, the initial part of it. And then we kind of we did start doing the morning meetings and the culture really came together where everyone was starting to see waste in their everyday lives. And a lot of the, the two second improvements we were doing uh, was, yeah, a lot of it was personal stuff. Um, so case in point for me, like, uh, not business related, we were wasting a lot of food between my wife and I, and mainly because we didn't know what we had in the fridge, right? We would make leftovers. And then four days later, we, we all get shoved to the back of the fridge and we wouldn't know what it was and it ended up getting wasted. And we ended up throwing it away a week later. Um, and so what we did is we enacted a sticker system. So every day has a different sticker color. And so when we make the food, we label that on the Tupperware of what the color the sticker is. So I can say, I can pull this down and say, Hey, as long as it hasn't been more than a week, Hey, this was made on Wednesday because it has a, a, you know, a yellow sticker. And it was something that was really simple uh, just because we were looking at the waste that we were having and which was food waste in this case and making a, a super simple, you know, $2 purchase off of Amazon and putting stickers uh, on our right. food. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other examples that people had with, you know, they uh, organized their purse and they managed to find that like 90% of the things in their purse were not useful to them, right? Or, or were only useful- they were carrying in a, them around everywhere. Right, they're only useful like, you know, 10% of the time when they went to this particular place. Um, and so that's kind of the culture that we ended up having. And, and, and I think part of that is, is also, you know, not only building the culture, but also holding people accountable to that as well, right? You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to say that you have a culture of this and kind of push it down from the top, from the top down. It's another thing to have, you know, your lowest guy on the totem pole leading a team every day and having to be responsible for their own uh, two second lean improvements that they're doing their own improvements within their own life. Um, and once that kind of happens, you start seeing it all over the place, like in your business and your personal life and your relationships and how you interact with people. Like it just, it kind of takes over your life. So it, it really made a big difference for us. You're a business owner or someone that's really big in real estate, right? And a lot of your podcast listeners are business owners. How did it feel for you as a business owner before versus after everyone in your team started thinking exactly like that i mean it was how, exciting how, how was it? yeah i mean i was excited you know it, like i said it was at the end of a of a day for me but like dude i i i was ramped up to to have uh have these meetings every day to to see what new things i could learn and to see what new improvements were being made um and and see how everyone was kind of growing and really interacting uh with, with the rest of the group i mean it it was amazing and in in you know in one of the things that I first thought about when I heard about lean is like, Oh, how can this so be profitable? Work. No. So the word work. And then you said the word amazing. So work was amazing. Yeah. Right. That, that's pretty crazy. 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, 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 no. I, you know, one of the points I want to bring up with the culture side of thing is, and we've talked about this pretty extensively. So I think you kind of had two people in terms of business owners that approach it in terms of lean, but you have the guys who think about it, like, how can this make a profit for me? Like, what is the tangible end result of this? And then you have the other guys who see, oh, this is a culture where people are continuously improving and it may not be, you know, an immediate, Hey, this is, this guy, you know, stopped walking to, you know, five feet a day and that saved me $20. It's more of like what that person extra product, uh, extra productivity that they had um, that, during that time or the extra mind space that they, they were able to gain back. Um, and it's more the intangible aspects of it that whether you like it or not, it ends up being more dollars down the road. Right. Uh, and I think that's what a lot, I think more the sales guys are kind of um, it's hard for them to see is that, you know, the culture that you're building now may not be immediately, you know, since back in your pocket, but it's, it's the savings that you find down the road that may end up saving you millions and millions of dollars down the way. But it's hard to kind of see that from a certain perspective, if you're only thinking about it in the tangible value. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's your on point. And, and, you know, we can get back to my story here in a second, but for <laughs> sure. yours, let me ask you one thing. Sure. Before versus after, after you had all that, your, your people were engaged. Before that, you likely, and I'm, I'm just extrapolating based on my experience with all business owners, you likely had this thing where you're constantly on edge, you're constantly learning, you have to be the problem solver every time. Mm -hmm. And then after you got excited, and yes, all the imp improvements that you guys were talking about were pens and color coding your lunch menu and whatever it may be, small stuff, the teeny tiny stuff. Remember the stuff that smart people won't believe works. How did it feel later, right? We're figuring out emails. How did it feel later with your team? Were there still those massive problems that popped up randomly out of the blue or were they just kind of gone? Yeah, I mean, they ain't. They they ended up going away pretty quickly um, or they, or we recognized them quicker and responded to them quicker than we would have, because it's not me as the business owner that has to hear about it from 10 people and know away. It's that person who found the problem that took the necessary steps or at least brought the attention to it that was needed to get it, you know, solved pretty quickly. Right. Um, and, you know, that brings up a good point. I think a lot of business owners think that they have to be an Island into themselves and that, everyone that works underneath them doesn't really add a lot of value or doesn't really, it can't really make those big decisions or, or solve these problems. But more often than not, you'll find that the business owner is the one who, yeah, they may have a vision in the, in the uh, build a culture for the company, but it's everyone else who's actively doing the job that finds a solution to all these problems. I mean, think about uh, if you just look at how the United States government is set up, like, yes, the president obviously has a lot of power, but like he couldn't get anything done if it wasn't for Congress or if it wasn't for the Supreme Court kind of keeping everyone in check or everyone underneath him that, you know, runs the White House and the rest of the country. Right. The agencies that carry everything out. Yeah, exactly. Like those people are the experts in all this. He just kind of makes the final decision on things. And you're you're describing uh, one of the most important wastes. Uh, it's, it's listed as either the last waste, but it's kind of in a circle. So in a way, it could be the first waste. And it's called Wasted Employee Genius. And everyone is a genius, right? And so many business owners do, do it to themselves. They, they remain a silo of information, probably because they didn't know any better. Um, they didn't have a training to be a business owner. They're just trying their best. Mm -hmm. And what it leads to is they have to be the person that comes up with all the problems. Well, instead, my secret weapon is I don't focus on my company hardly ever. I just focus on the culture of my company and that everyone below me who I hire, remember I hired someone, so I didn't have to do that thing. So many business owners hire five people or 10 people or a hundred people, but they're the ones still doing everything. And because they don't know how to do that. So I, my job as the business owner, and again, people aren't going to believe it's this simple. I focus on the culture. Do they understand it? Am I going to teach them and then empower them to make the change and then give them the permission to do so and expect them to and hold them accountable to that? And that's what I'm going to pay attention to a byproduct of all of my employees doing their jobs. Why I hired them initially mm -hmm. is that one, I don't have to do that job. Number two, number one, number two profits is automatic. I rarely talk about, I never chase, I rarely chase product profits. I'm always chasing the culture and the little stuff. Is this guy doing all he can do to grow himself? If so, and I've put him in the right position, 
then that's going to automatically save you money, like you said uh, before. It's all those little things that add up, and it's that waste. Is, there's that wasted productivity that I I used to have to walk across the way to go to the bathroom, and now the bathroom's right here, and that saves me 36 miles less I have to walk. Okay, that year. Okay, well that year you have to walk that long. It's less work on me as the as the guy who's actually doing it, and the the that means I have more time to be able to accomplish that thing, to get that order out, to get that unit flipped. Um, you know, I did this crazy thing with my contractor guy. Um, it gives you more time to think. We just sat with a contractor and we went over, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a federal thing, maybe it's a state thing. You're not allowed to have the, the um, window blinds, can't have strings anymore. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And when you go from window the stringless ones, some have two mounting brackets, and then now the new ones have four mounting brackets. Well, the four mounting brackets for window blinds doubled the time, or actually more than double the time to mount um, window blinds. Well, if you're a property manager and you have 1,200 units, and then you have X amount of time to turn an apartment before someone moves in, that's really impactful. But no one would think, ah, I'm spending, window blinds are my problem. Okay, well, that's where I, they're wrong. And that's why there's, I'm saying, Hey, business owner, pay attention to the window blinds, pay attention to where your tools are at. Are your tools on wheels? Can you lift your tools onto a five gallon bucket? So your contractors aren't bending over 36 inches down and then coming back up 36 inches in the same example, just putting the tools on a five gallon bucket upside down saved uh, them. I think my guy, my contractor guys, I think it was 19 miles of bending per job, not per year, per job, bending over and coming back up. Well, 19 miles is hard on your back. Is he gonna be able to go home and rest easier? You know, it's those little things. If yeah. you can see, teach them to see that, you don't have to solve the bucket issue. The magic I have is that two second lean impacts uh, real estate profoundly is I applied that to teams. Mm -hmm. And um, real estate is one of the places that, even if you are brand new to real estate, you got your core four, that's a team that's already ready to work for you. If you can manage that well, then you can scale very quickly. Absolutely. Man, I love it. Love, love talking to you about this. And I'm sure we could, we could keep going on and on. And um, if you guys look at uh, the bio for, for uh, Hugh, you'll see a lot of how he used lean in his, in his real estate career and, and how it freaking made him take off in terms of, you know, the processes and the amount of money that he made off of these, off of these properties, which is, really kind of ultimately the, the bottom line there. Um, but, uh, but I want to belabor the point, but Hugh, we're getting towards the end of the, uh, the episode here. Are you ready for, to get in the snapshot round? Let's do it. All head plank cavitate snapshot tube tube. All right. First question for you, Hugh, what is your number one failure in real estate? My number one failure in real estate is that, um, you know, that's a tough one. I feel like I fail constantly all, all day, every day. And that's a great thing. Um, um, I think my number one failure in real estate is that I didn't properly scale sooner and bring on delegation. So I waited a year uh, before I brought delegation on. Uh, and, you know, it, it's funny because most people wait like five or six years. So I'm, I'm saying the same right. thing, even though I'm I'm uh, new and then 15 months in, I brought on, you know, uh, a second guy to help me manage things. But yeah, it's probably definitely, I didn't, I didn't trust in other people enough to bring on someone to help delegate. I didn't delegate to it soon enough. Okay, fair enough. All right, as a uh, military related investor, what advice do you have for other military investors to be successful? I can say it from a spouse standpoint, because I was a spouse. Um, Above anything else, this is the one area where I could have moved and been PCS anywhere. I could have jumped in and been able to either invest or become a realtor agent, uh, an agent, uh, or I could have just done that anywhere. And I know so many spouses that when they got PCS, it was like the end of the, I mean, it's really tough because then they have to find a new job and, and then, then their resume looks all weird. Or you can just be like, ah, I'm a realtor. Oh, I know people from there. We lived there for three years. Now I'm going to, uh, you know, I already was used to handling the books. You know what? Why don't you talk to my buddy over there and you get that referral money that's coming in. And so I would 
look heavily into real estate and there are things that you can do. Maybe investing is not for everybody, but the investing world is extremely flexible and can be done from anywhere with a computer. And even if it's not done, you can do it from just referrals alone if you're an agent. So um, I'd say don't be afraid, ask questions, jump in, uh, especially if you're a spouse. Uh, so many people, so many spouses I talked to were just like, man, I wish I could, but I can't because of this position I'm in. Well, this is the perfect position that allows you to have that stability everywhere. You can become an expert at it and move on. Absolutely. All right. And the last question for you here, what is your dream? My dream is to empower as many real, uh, not real, not real estate, but as many business owners, um, that want to listen, right? Because a lot of them don't. But as many people who want to help themselves, I want to help them. Whether it's a it's a business person or a, just a, a normal individual, um, I want to share the knowledge that other people freely or inexpensively shared with me and allowed me to get to where I'm at today. Because I'm at the very beginning of my journey. And 15 months ago, I knew nothing about real estate. Here I am, a millionaire with 118 doors. That that's that's insane. But I'm also not the sharpest crayon in the toolbox, right? So uh, you shouldn't even have crayons in the toolbox. And here I am. So I want to help anyone with as much information as I can and empower those people to let them know that they can do it, whatever it is, and point them in directions um, and changes, changing the way they think to help them out if possible. Perfect. I love it, man. That's a great, it's a great, a great dream to have to have as many people as you can. Um, so Hugh, you know, we've, had a great talk here and 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 you know i've definitely learned a lot even though we i feel like we've, we've talked pretty extensively about lean um but i mean you've obviously had a very successful path even in you know in the even in the past month uh, 18 months but you know the lean culture that you've been able to build within your own companies and build with uh, in other countries i think is is tremendous and i think it has helped a lot of people and i think it would continue to help more people who who um, could learn this process and take it on board not only within themselves but within their company so if people want to learn more about you, where can they go? Um, two places. The first place is I have a YouTube channel that's dedicated to business, finance, and real estate. Um, those topics are generally boring, so I try to make them fun. Uh, and so if you go on to uh, Hugh Carnahan, W2 The Millionaire, uh, that is my YouTube channel. And then also if you want to email W2 To Millionaire, so it's W2, the number two, and then T-O, millionaire at gmail.com, that is also a way to get a hold of me. All right. And uh, we'll include that in the, in the show notes as well. But Hugh, thanks again for coming on, sharing your, your wisdom and your experience. And uh, I really hope people reach out to you. I think, it's, I think you'll be able to do tremendous things for them. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you are a military investor and found this episode of the Lessons in Real Estate show packed with great information, tell your friends and leave a five-star rating on your listening platform. Every comment is read and appreciated. Don't forget to check out our weekly episodes of PCI Teaches, brought to you by Pinto Capital Investments. Learn about basic and advanced topics in real estate investing. Catch updates on Anthony's journey through learn and teach segments. And listen to the tales of other military investors and real estate professionals every week. We'll catch you next time on the Lessons in Real Estate show.